my name is Shelby Rosasco. I'm the new Peak Extension Specialist here at the University of Wyoming. Today I'm going to be talking with you about heifer selection, development, and how we can manage heifers to be successful over their lifetime. Now when we think about heifer development, we need to start by understanding that every production system is different and ultimately a producer needs to do what works best within their system in order to get their desired result and help meet their goals for their cow herd. Now there's still some central questions we can ask or think about when we think about managing heifers in general. The first being, are we developing or purchasing heifers? So are we going to retain heifers from our own herd? And this can be important for producers because it allows them more control over the genetics of the animal, as well as more control over the pre and post weaning development of these heifers, which can be influential in their longevity. If we're purchasing heifers, this may be a good option for producers who maybe don't have the pasture or the resources necessary to retain heifers or manage them over the winter prior to their first breeding season. And it may also be a good option for a producer who's in a more terminal sire situation where they wanna purchase heifers who have some more maternal characteristics about them. Now, if we're retaining heifers, we need to consider how we're going to manage these heifers, especially from a nutritional standpoint. And if we're going to buy heifers, we need to be asking the question of, when are we going to purchase these heifers? Are we purchasing yearling heifers and breeding them ourselves, or are we purchasing bred heifers? Now, the other thing we need to be thinking about is how do we pick out and select the right heifers, not only from a phenotypic standpoint, but from a productivity standpoint. How do we select that heifer that's going to be fertile and productive over her lifetime? Within that, if we're retaining heifers, we need to be considering when we're going to make that decision. Is that a weaning or are we waiting until the end of the breeding season and maybe picking out heifers that became pregnant early? And I'll talk about the importance of that here in a few slides. We also need to consider the economic ramifications of our heifer development system and what the break even is for our heifers. How long is it taking that heifer to break even and start providing a producer a positive return? And so I have three plus years written there because there's a range of time that it's gonna take that heifer to recoup her cost. A lower input system, it may take that heifer three years or three calves in order to recoup that cost. In a system that's using a lot of input, maybe in a dry lot with a lot of harvested feed stuff, maybe it's taking that heifer, you know, upwards of six years and some research shows up to 10 years in some of these high input systems to recoup those costs. And that's not necessarily economically viable or efficient. So we need to be thinking about heifer development systems like we do a stalker operation that we evaluate the financial inputs of those systems. Now, when we think about our heifers, it's important to understand what we're asking that heifer to do over her first few years of life, because we really put a lot of pressure on her, especially from a reproductive standpoint. So our expectations for that heifer are that she is going to attain puberty either prior to at the start of that first breeding season. Ideally, in most production systems, she's going to become pregnant in time to calve at two years of age. She's going to calve without assistance. She's then going to wean a marketable calf. And then she's going to rebreed as a first calf heifer and then maintain a 365 day cavern interval over her lifetime and stay in the herd an adequate amount of time. And so what we're trying to do with heifer development is we're trying to build a better cow. And so we really need to be thinking about this from a reproductive standpoint for the fact that pregnancy has four times greater economic impact than any other production trait. And so one way we can put pressure on the herd for higher fertility animals is to select heifers who become pregnant early in their first breeding season. Now, the reason this can be so important is this data set here from USDA Meat Animal Research Center. And so this data set has over 16,000 heifers in it. And they're classified based on calving period. So the green line is indicating heifers that calved in the first 21 days. The black line indicating heifers calving in the second 21 day period. And then the red line, anybody who calved in the third or later calving period. So if we focus on that green line, what we see is that these heifers that calved in the first 21 days, so heifers that became pregnant early in their first breeding season, actually have an increased proportion of heifers remaining in the herd. So we see an increase in longevity. 
this could be really beneficial for a producer because we're not having as many animals fall out of the herd. And so they're able to not only recoup development costs, but be providing a positive return. This also becomes important from a productivity standpoint when, when we look at calf performance and weaning weights specifically. So when we look at average weaning weights, what we see is that those animals that calved in the first 21 days, those are in the black bars, we see that they have an increased average weaning weight over six calves compared to heifers who calved later in the calving in their first calving period. And this equates to those animals um, weaning roughly three quarters of a calf more over their lifetime. This can have a huge production and economic advantage for a producer. So we need to be considering how can we manage these heifers to achieve that? Well, we can think about breeding more heifers than necessary in order to a preg check then pick out only the heifers that became pregnant early. Or maybe we consider tightening up our breeding season and to a more confined time point. Um, and maybe we also consider using a synchronization protocol and, and implementing a progesterone source to help jumpstart these heifers going into their first breeding season. So if our goal is to get heifers to become pregnant early in the breeding season, we have to consider how we're going to manage those heifers because management of fertility is not a single stage event. We can't just consider how, for, how fertile are those animals at that one time point where they're getting bred, we're impacting their fertility all the time. And so I have listed here a number of factors that we know are going to affect fertility in our heifers and that we need to be thinking about. So again, how we manage these heifers is going to impact her fertility, which is her success for a producer. And so I'm going to focus more on how we can nutritionally manage these heifers to be successful. So through the 1960s and 1980s, there was this discussion and research that focused on this target body weight approach. So it was asking what body weight should our heifers achieve by the start of the breeding season? This research ended up leading to these guidelines that heifers should get to 60 to 65% of mature body weight at breeding. Now this is an extremely safe number because this research looked to maximize reproductive performance. So it looked to maximize how many heifers were pubertal at the start of the breeding season, look to maximize how many heifers were pregnant in that breeding season. But what we need to think about is how can we optimize our systems? Because in more, more extensive Western environments like Wyoming, they're a little more arid. Um, from an economic standpoint, the 60 to 65% mature body weight guideline may be an, a challenge from an economic standpoint, some of our production systems. And so research kind of shifted to looking at this lighter target body weight or these lower input systems. And what we see is that at that lighter target body weight, we actually reduce development costs. So we're being more economically efficient, but we're not impairing reproductive performance in these animals. And so when we look at some of this data, and this is all data from Dr. Rick Bunsen's lab in Nebraska, what we see is we have that, that decrease in pre-breeding body weight in our low gain heifers or heifers developed that lighter target body weight. Those are the white bars. And we do see this decrease in percentage of heifers who are pubertal at the start of the breeding season, which is a concern. But when we look at overall pregnancy rates, we see a similar proportion of low and high gain heifers or low and high body weight heifers getting pregnant within that breeding season. So again, we're not de being detrimental to that reproductive performance by using a low, more low input or cost-effective system. So another thing we can consider from a nutritional management standpoint is altering the timing of gain. So getting past the mindset that heifers need to look good every time we go out and look at them or throughout that development period. So we can actually delay gains and push gains to the last 45 or 30 days prior to the start of the breeding season and still see similar reproductive performance. So a good example of this is a study by Lynch and others in 1997. So heifers were either on an even rate of gain, and that's the solid black line, or a late rate of gain. And so those heifers who had delayed gain, so they were on a really minimal gain over the first part of that development period, so to November to March, and then these heifers were pushed this last 45 to 30 days from March to April, what we see is that there's no difference in pregnancy rates. 
These heifers still attain approximately the same pre-breeding body weight. We're not seeing a difference in pregnancy rates. And actually, if you go look at this study in year two, there's an increase in first service conception rates in these late gain heifers. And so what we think this may be is maybe there's a flushing effect happening here where when we increase that nutrient intake that last period, we're actually having a flushing effect like you see or what gets talked about in the sheep industry. The other thing we're doing here is we're maybe decreasing development costs because while we're increasing nutrient intake to get this higher average daily gain, we're also utilizing compensatory gain during this time point. And so we're being more efficient with our gain during that time point, utilizing that compensatory growth. Now, the other thing we can consider when we think about um, our stair step systems is there's some more recent data out there looking at how stair step systems impact the ovarian reserve. So the ovarian reserve is how many oocytes and eggs do these animals have within their ovary that they're going to use over their lifetime? And so there's some interesting data um, from US Mark um, over in Nebraska from Dr. Preetley um, that looks at developing heifers in a dry lot on a stair step nutritional program. So that's a late gain system and how that impacts the ovarian reserve. And what we see here is we have an increase in the number of primordial follicles, which is our indicator of the size of the ovarian reserve. So the more primordial follicles, the larger the ovarian reserve. So this increased ovarian reserve in these stair step heifers may suggest that, that stair step diet may allow for an increase in reproductive longevity. Now I continued this data and followed this out when I was doing my PhD at New Mexico State University because we wanted to see if we could use this stair step system out in heifers who were grazing native range and still see the same benefit. And so what we saw when we looked at the ovarian reserve was that we still had this increase in primordial follicle numbers and that increase in the ovarian reserve in our stair step heifers, regardless of if they were developed in the dry lot or out grazing native range. Now, what was interesting is that we actually had similarities in the ovarian reserve in our control, our constant gain diet and our steer step diet in native range developed heifers, suggesting that you know there may be some differences due to the diet and adaptability of heifers out grazing native range. But overall, this steer step system, not only does it allow for decreased um, inputs in our system, but it may actually allow for an increase in longevity in these heifers, then it's something we're going to continue looking at moving forward. Now, the other thing from a nutritional standpoint we need to think about is, again, I said fertility is not a single stage event. So we need to be thinking about how we're managing these heifers, not only leading up to AI or the start of the breeding season, but also throughout the breeding season. So Perry and others in 2013, did a study where heifers were either developed out on pasture, so that's in the black bars, or developed in the dry lot. And all heifers were then placed on range after AI. And so heifers were developed 65% mature body weight. They were similar proportion of heifers pubertal at the start of the breeding season. But what we see is dry lot heifers who were then placed on native range or out on pasture after AI had this 10% decrease in AI conception rates. And so that drop in nutrient intake or average daily gain that they had going from the dry lot out to the pasture decreased those AI conception rates. And so if we're trying to get more heifers pregnant at the beginning of the breeding season, we need to consider how we're nutritionally managing these heifers. So either leaving them in the dry lot for a period of time after AI or adapting them to pasture prior to AI, or maybe making sure we have adequate supplement once they're out on pasture. We just need to be considering how we nutritionally manage these animals. So this heifer development time point is unique in that we can think about putting pressure to select for fertility and reproductive traits, but we also need to be thinking about how is the management strategies we're using impacting these heifers from a long-term standpoint. And so we also need to think about if we're overdeveloping these heifers, so if we're developing heifers um, to be really fat and at this high percentage of mature body weight, um, we may be allowing some subfertile heifers into our herd. So these subfertile heifers maybe need that additional nutrient 
nutrients that they're getting in these dry lot or these intense development systems to maintain reproductive function. And so they get bred as a heifer and make it into the herd. But then as a cow, if we place her out on pasture and we're asking her to be lactating, when we're asking her to rebreed as a first calf heifer, while also still having a growth requirement, we may be asking too much of her. And so she then starts falling out of the herd as a two and three year old cow. And so we need to be thinking about how can we manage these heifers to be adapted to their environment and also use that as, as a way to select these heifers. So we know that longevity and reproduction have relatively low heritability, but our management strategies or heifer development protocols can potentially impact cow retention. Uh, and that's what I showed you with the stair step system. And there's and there's some unique data that's out there showing that heifers developed on range, you know, oftentimes stay in the herd longer because they're adapted to that um, future production environment that we're going to ask them to perform in. And so we also need to be, again, thinking about the economic implications of our heifer development systems. So our heifers are worth the sum of revenue they earn over their lifetime, and that includes salvage value minus the expenses they create. So when we're thinking about investing in replacements, we need to think about purchase price or opportunity costs. What are our development costs? What's gonna be the break even for that heifer? How many offspring does she need to produce to start providing a positive return? What's her annual cow cost? What's our replacement rate from year to year? And then how is the cattle market factoring into that? Cause that's gonna indicate, you know, not only how much money we're making off of her offspring, but it's gonna indicate if we're purchasing heifers and what her salvage value is going to be. So within that, we also need to think about how can we add value or increase efficiency in our replacement heifer systems. Um, and so when I was down in New Mexico State University and my master's and my PhD, we had several producers ask us the question of, can we use growth running implants in our replacement heifers? Is, you know, traditionally it's been suggested that you never keep heifers that received a growth rate implant. But, you know, we wanted to go back and reevaluate this and answer this question for producers. And so we did a study comparing control heifers so they were never implanted with heifers who received a Cinevexy implant at the branding time point. So they were two to three months of age and got that Cinevexy implant. Now, as you would expect, when we look at body weight performance, we have this increased weaning body weight in our implanted heifers um, due to that Cinevex implant. Now, if a producer was in a drought situation and making a decision on whether or not to retain heifers, if he was going to sell all of his heifers at this time point, this increased body weight could be advantageous and provide him um, with an increased um, economic advantage or a profit advantage. Now, what was interesting is we saw this body weight advantage be maintained through the yearling time point and then all the way through the start of the breeding season, which again could be advantageous for a producer. So one of the biggest concerns in the previous research using implants and replacement heifers is how does this impact reproductive performance, specifically pregnancy rates? And so what we saw in this in the current study is that there was no difference in first service conception rates between our implant and our control heifers as well as no difference in overall pregnancy rates over a 60 day breeding season between our control and implanted heifers. So we're not seeing the negative impact of that growth rate implant. So when we follow that out, what we see is that we actually had no long-term impact of these growth rate implants. So when we look at the percentage of heifers remaining in the herd through five years of age, we have a similar survivability of control and implant heifers during this time point. So indicating that not only are we not negatively impacting heifers in that first breeding season, we're not impacting their ability to stay in the herd. So overall, just to kind of wrap things up, um, you know, heifer development and selection is going to be unique for each operation. So a low input system may work for one person, whereas another um, producer you know, a dry lot situation where they're developing heifers to 65% mature body weight may be a really great option for them because they can maintain that body condition score and nutrient input for those heifers throughout their lifetime. Uh, we also need to be considering how we manage these heifers and how that's going to impact overall productivity and longevity 
Um, because again, management of fertility is not a single stated event. So we need to be thinking about nutritional management and handling and all these different things and how that's going to play into their ability to perform from a reproductive standpoint and then stay in the herd. And so be thinking about economic ramifications of management as well as long-term uh, ramifications of these management strategies. And then how can we um, utilize some value added type products such as a growth running implant in order to be more efficient in our production systems. And maybe this doesn't work for every producer, but it may work for a producer, especially in a drought year to increase body weight um, while maintaining reproductive performance if some of those heifers are gonna stay in the herd. Um, so with that, I would be um, happy to have any questions you guys may have. So feel free to reach out um, and either email me or call me. Um, there's a lot of heifer development research and data out there. So reach out. I'm happy to discuss more management protocols and development strategies in more detail. Thank you.